While we sleep, the guardians of the night take to the streets, having said goodbye to those they love. Each other knowing they may never say these words again, they face the evil that we run from. They dedicate their lives to those that would hate them because they wear the badge. They wear the badge not for the glory or recognition, but for the passion to help others. This is the LEO First Podcast. We'll talk to the men and women in law enforcement, those that have retired, those that keep the prisons secure, and anyone who's impacted by law enforcement. We'll peel back the curtain, and you'll get the real stories, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Every law enforcement officer has a story to tell. Get ready to hear from the men and women who put their lives on the line every day for their communities and their country. Welcome to the LEO First Podcast. Now, here's your host, Michael Laidler. Hey everybody, it's Michael Laidler, the host of the LEO First Podcast. And it's been a few weeks that I've recorded and that's simply because I've been out of town, traveling, moving around. And I only like to do my podcast at home whenever I'm recording because the quality of them at my house is a lot better than any hotel room or any conference room. However, we have a special guest with us tonight and I've been thrilled to speak with her. You know why? Because she did something that not everybody else does. She reached out to me to get on the podcast. She actually went through my website. And at first I thought it was spam. I'm not going to lie. I had a look at it. I was very <laughs> confused. I was like, website lead, Deborah Green. Like I was like, who is this? So I did forget to respond. And I can tell you through her persistency, I knew and I continue to know that she's going to be a great guest on tonight's show. And that's because when you have someone that's that persistent, you know their passion is there, and you know that they've <laughs> overcome a lot of things in their lives that can benefit all of us. And that's something that we always do with this show. We're always trying to humanize the badge, humanize the people that contribute to law enforcement, people that just want to see us get better because they're good people. And I know based on the little bit that I've learned about our guest tonight that she's going to fill all those gaps because she has that persistency and consistency that we're looking for. Now, further, without further ado, without more of my rambling, we're going to have our guest tonight, Deborah Green, tell us a little bit about herself. Deborah, tell us about you. Hi, thank you. Um, I, 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 I like your word persistence. I felt like I was being a pest. <laughs> no pest, no pest. You did good. But, uh, oh, that, thank you. Um, I'm Deborah Green. I'm a retired public safety dispatcher from El Dorado County Sheriff's Office in California. Um, I started my career in 1986 as a communication specialist in the California Army National Guard, uh, became a military police officer. Uh, later, um, in 1992, I was hired at Sacramento Police Department as a dispatcher. So my military career, my dispatch career kind of overlapped a little bit. Um, and that was around the time of the Rodney King riot. So um, I was in actually in the academy for the police department and got called down to L.A. to uh, serve as protection for uh, Los Angeles during the riots. Um, then, uh, released on probation from Sacramento police because I was not quite fast enough for that department. And so I went looking for a smaller department, ended up at El Dorado County in 1994 and then retired from there in 2021. You um, spent a lot of time in law enforcement and yeah. 1986, going through Rodney King, just the state of California in general, is a beast for everybody to be part of. So, and I know you're about to say it, and I think the lag kind of threw us off a little bit, yeah. but um, how has that impacted, like, who you've become as a person up to this point? Oh, my gosh. Well, I've, you know, I've been in public service for almost 40 years, so... um. I, I I don't know. It just, it was who I was. I wanted to serve the public when I was younger. I wanted to do something 
in service. Uh, that's one of the reasons I joined the National Guard, just so that I could, because I was 19 at the time. So I was more finding myself and fi trying to find that little niche. And so when I came back from basic training in AIT, um, well, I didn't come home for that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I sort of met my first husband and we moved to Texas. So, you know, I moved away from home for a little while, then uh, got divorced, remarried, moved back to California. So um, I, I don't know. It just, it's when, when you're, how do we, how do we want to put this? Um, when you're female, you have more of a caring personality to begin with. So I think going into law enforcement and then, you know, into dispatch specifically kind of nurtured that because you want to help people and you want to care for people. Um, you know, little did I know that it would uh, completely destroy my mental health. But, um, you know, I mean, you you go in with, with good intentions and, you know, ho and hope to, to end up that way. You know, I, I was supposed to retire next year, but, you know, things happened and... Sorry. <laughs> No, you're good. No. Um so so um yeah. So I you know, it just I I think it made me a better person in the end. Um and you know, learning from from all of that. Uh -oh. you, you know, it's Hold funny on. as I listen to your story, especially the beginning parts. First, I live in Texas. So the fact that you've come in and out of Texas at some point, I guess might, might be part of our connection. Don't get me wrong. I'm not born and raised in Texas, but I have about a total of 10 years here. So oh, pretty yeah. much I'm, I'm almost a Texan at this point. I, I have no problem saying it. I love this state. <laughs> they paid my bills. My son was born here. So for me, Texas is no issues at all. Um, As you were building in your career and – you developed different skill sets. And I one thing you said was you talked about mental wellness. You talked you, you mentioned it briefly, some of the things that you were not ready to go through. One of the things that really impacted me early on before I even got in law enforcement was my sister was a dispatcher for the agency that I started for. Mm. The reason why I even started that police department was because of her. So for me, I've nice. always had a a um a connection to any dispatcher because I know mm -hmm. without my sister becoming a dispatcher initially, my initiation into law enforcement at 19 wouldn't have happened. I would have got there eventually, uh, maybe not in Tallahassee, but it was because of her getting into that occupation that I realized that I was more ready than I thought. But never mind my my part of the dispatching. You've seen <laughs> a lot in dispatching, and it's so oh, different. Gosh, yeah. When you're behind the when you're behind the phone, you're behind the computer taking calls. So, how do you think? Like, how is some of those experiences different than what you would expect it when you first started? Oh my gosh! Um, well, there wasn't when I first started as a as a dispatcher. I think the only exposure in the media was that little voice on chips. I don't know if you remember hearing her or even on um the the show Adam 12, you know, mm. one Adam 12, uh, you know, 415 with chains and knives. I that always cracked me up. Um, but you know, <laughs> you that was the the very little exposure, and it was just a voice on the other end of the action. So I really didn't know what what dispatching was exactly. So I did do a sit a sit along prior to it to being hired, which was nice. And then you got to see what what went on. And it was basically it's the it's the heartbeat of the department. It's where everything comes in and gets, you know, gets moved out to where it needs to go. And I don't think people realize that. You know, the the 
nothing happens in the city that you're working for without dispatch knowing about it. Mm. <laughs> That's true. Which is, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's like the central nervous system and, you know, it just, just right there. And it's so incredible to work, to work in dispatch. And I don't think, you know, the cops on the street don't understand it. It's just, you know, we may not be out there, you know, going to calls with a guns a blazing, but, you know, we're still going to these calls with these guys in, in a different, in a different way. So how did that make you feel um, as far as not being able to respond out in the field, especially for these calls that you knew all about? Like, oh, like how was that anticipation? Because I never felt that. Well, coming from being a military police officer mm. and being out in in the middle of things and then going into dispatch, I always had that that urge to just run out the door get in a car and go to the call <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's hard you have a there's there's sometimes a sense of helplessness that you can't physically help that person in need on the other end of the phone you know, you're doing all you can by sending people, you know, you have people that are so desperate, to, you know, the, the just get somebody here. And it's like, we're getting somebody there. And a lot of times they, that, that person that's calling you doesn't understand and doesn't hear or see what's going on in the background. They just hear your voice mm -hmm. and they're like, well, they're not on the way. You didn't dispatch them. And they, and you try to tell them, look, I'm the one on this part of the computer. And I, if you can hear me typing, because, you know, on all the calls, you can hear the, the keyboards clicking away. You know, you try to explain to them, I'm talking to my partner on the computer and my partner's the one sending the guys out, you know, because you have a call taker and then you have a radio dispatcher usually. Um, sometimes I did double duty at the the last department I was at. Right. where you're taking a phone call and dispatching them out. I did though one time uh had a ride along schedule one night and um I sat up and dispatched for a little bit before I went out. I took a phone call, I entered the call, I got up, took my stuff, went out, got in the patrol car and went to that call. Wow. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> now that doesn't happen often. That does not happen often, but that was that was a lot of, you know, just to see the whole process was was really interesting. Even though I had been in dispatch, you know, several years by then. So. And with all this time in dispatch, getting a chance to kind of do ride longs here and there. Everybody has that one call that really touches them. And I know you've had several throughout the 20 plus years you've done it. Early on in your career, do you remember what call kind of stood out that made you realize that this was a very stressful job? Um, yeah. I, um, well, I, going out on a ride along, I went to a a, a stabbing. That was kind of interesting, and the 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 person that was stabbed was a young kid. Mm. And just Oof. seeing that whole process and trying to keep him calm. And I was actually a, a very um, active participant in that call where, you know, right along, you kind of sit back. But it was kind of like they're trying to get the kid calm and trying to ask. He was asking a lot of questions and nobody was answering them for him. So I tried to calm him down and answer those questions that he was curious about just to keep him calm. And, you know, not a lot of people realize it, you know, they're more concerned with, okay, you have a, you know, <laughs> you have this stab wound in your shoulder and let's take care of that. But not understanding that that's a person you're taking care of. So, you know, seeing that kind of, kind of thing, you know, you just kind of like, there's a lot of bad things that happen in the world, but, you know, that's what I'm here for is to, to help 
kind of curtail those bad things. Yeah, it, and there's a study out there, and I, I believe dispatchers can definitely fit into to this particular um, statistic or data as well as it says that law enforcement first responders see about 700 traumatic incidents throughout their mm -hmm. career versus the non-law enforcement um, that sees maybe four to five or something like that, or let's say five right. to ten. Um, and as dispatch, you were seeing like, well, not seeing, at least hearing an experience, which I think is right. tough. Because hearing people's voices and you you learn a lot about communication when the only way you're able to communicate or talk someone off that proverbial ledge is through the phone. Like it's not like exactly. when, I was, when I was a cop where I can go out there and physically communicate as far as like my body language, my posture. Mm -hmm. You had to do the same thing through your voice. So when you look at those traumatic incidents and you see some of the things that have been changing over the last couple of years, I would say years, I wouldn't even say decades in law enforcement. Do you see us becoming any better or any worse with communicating these traumatic events when it comes to law enforcement? I think it's getting better. I mean, we're getting a lot more training and I think that um, um, I took a, a class in critical incident stress management um, and that really helped with my communication skills in a in in the situations as you see them um of course i was also in therapy since 2016 so that kind of helped too um you know learning those tools and trying to use the tools that i had learned to calm people down on the other end of the phone um i know there was one lady that was having a panic attack and I used the tools that I had learned from my therapist and got her calmed down. So, you know, <laughs> it's getting better. It's not where we need to be yet. Um, as far as, you know, with, with the, our inner action with the public, um, it's not even anywhere near we, where we need to be at with their interaction with ourselves. Mm hmm and that, you know, that's another thing we, we need to work on. So it's interesting because the year you said you started therapy or at least start doing it consistently was 2016. And at that point, you were already, what, almost 20 years into the industry of yeah. high stress, for sure. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so now now I love I, I love the fact that you highlighted the fact that you were able to take these tools from therapy and apply to calming somebody down. Now we're going to take that same concept and go back, let's say 15 years to the five year into a force responder, Deborah, what would you tell her about therapy now knowing what you know today? Knowing what I know today, I would tell myself to go get a therapist. Mm. Um, uh, I had a lot and looking back, I had a lot of anxiety and depression. Um, from stuff that happened while I was in the army to, you know, my first 911 call at Sacramento police was uh, a lady that had found her, her daughter uh, had committed suicide in the bathroom. Mm. Um, wow. So, you know, you have these cumulative little traumas that start building up and building up and building up. And, had I known back then the importance of having a therapist, I would have made sure to get one. And, you know, it's something we all can use. <laughs> I, I agree. Shoot, I use one. I have no I I I've said on yeah. many episodes in the past, I I wish I can tell the myself 18 years ago to start early and often because it's 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 mm -hmm. amazing. What a, a good therapist, and I say the first one's always going to get it right, but finding the right one that matches you, that really helps you bring out different things that you didn't think of. Because one word you use that I think is very um, prevalent and what we do is cumulative. Like we yes. have cumulative stress. Yes. It doesn't have to be like some military folks. You don't have to be stepping on an IED or you don't have to be <laughs> having your car bombed or, you know, you don't, you don't have to be in gunfire because back in the day, that's what we used to gauge as traumatic. We used to say, well, if you've never been shot at, what do you have to worry about? Or if you've 
never had to shoot at somebody like why are you so stressed out but right. as we've seen lately and I'm, and I'm, and i and i i always applaud the doctors the psychologists the scientists the researchers that have been compiling this information we realize that we have cumulative stress especially yes. as first responders whether you're a police officer deputy sheriff you're a dispatcher a firefighter a nurse military yes. wh whatever you want to classify <laughs> as first responder you we all have cumulative stress and absolutely based on what you've seen the five-year Deborah would have probably benefited a lot sooner as far as the mental uh, on how to handle. Oh gosh, yeah. Because yeah. you couldn't change your calls for service. We know that. So, oh gosh, no. <laughs> so with that, how do you, and this is probably the hardest part that I can see still, how do we get over the stigma of starting therapy? Um, By talking about it, by doing what I'm doing and going out and telling our stories and letting people know that there are people like us out there that are hurting also. Mm. Um, sorry. No, go. <laughs> um, um, I, over the years I had, you know, just, we've had shootings and stabbings and, and, all of this, um, back in 2007, three of my deputies were shot and injured. Um, um, <laughs> I was working nights that night, um, and it happened during the day, but I still had that effect um, because people were calling me at home while I was sleeping, <laughs> pardon me, um, to wake me up to ask me what was going on. And I'm like, hey, I'm sleeping. I have no idea what's going on. Um, so, you know, so you have that, you know, and I turned on the news to see one of my friends get put into the the air ambulance and taken to the hospital. Luckily, they all survived. But I still had that trauma of seeing my friends, even though I wasn't on duty, you, you know, you you see your friends hurt and injured and, and whatnot. Um, so I went in to work that night. Actually, I called in first to see if um, they needed me to come in early because it was just such a big incident that mm -hmm. was going on. And I was told, oh, no, everybody's fine here. And looking back, they weren't fine. They need, you know, this was you know, still 2007 and we were all, um, still in that. And it, it's a common phrase that I hear all the time. Suck it up buttercup mode. Yep. Just, you know, dry, suck it up and you're coming back the next day. That incident, those dispatchers shouldn't have been in the next day. And they should, you know, there should have been some form of debriefings and, and whatnot. And we've come so far in the last 15 years now that we're, we're having those critical incident debriefs right after the incidents and getting people help, but we're still not where we need to be. And um, sorry, <laughs> I didn't realize that would hit me that hard. Um, Go ahead. No, that's that's that's. Hey, I, and I want our <laughs> I want our viewers I'm, to know that regardless no. if you see the video of this or not, I mean, this is the real side of law enforcement. I mean, this is what happened. That like like it is like, it's stress. Like this ain't like this ain't no joke. <laughs> like people think that what we do is we're supposed to be able to bottle up how we're feeling and not show our emotions, but this is the real stuff. I mean, this is you, part of humanizing you can't the bottle bag. it up. Yeah, yeah, you can because it comes out when and you least expect it. it exactly. <laughs> and um, an, another one of my shootings, and and this is kind of really interesting, I guess. Um, I had a shooting back. Okay, let me think. <laughs> it was February of 2015. We okay. had a shooting, officer-involved shooting, where go to a domestic violence. Um, the guy's shooting at my officers. They're hiding behind trees, 
till the SWAT team could get there. Um, he set fire to the house. There was a lot going on. Everybody, nobody got hurt. Not even the suspect, which was good. Um, but, but a week later, I think it was about a week later, my granddaughter was born. And then I went uh, to the doctor. I had been diagnosed with a heart murmur at birth. Mm -hmm. So my doctor said, hey, you know, let's go in and get you checked out and uh, come to find out I had a, a malformed aortic valve and that was in stenosis and the cardiologist didn't know how I was uh, still standing up. And so I was in. So we had. So at that time, I'm I'm dealing with all of this health issue going on and we had our debrief at the same time so there was a lot of stress and stuff going on there and I had to deal with um having to go in for open heart surgery so in wow. April 2015 I went in for open heart surgery had a new valve put in um had three months off of work and went back to work as a dispatcher <laughs> So looking back, maybe I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody, you always want to get back I mean. in the fight. <laughs> uh, exactly, exactly. So I um developed what's called a uh, post perfusion syndrome, which um its nickname is called pump head. And what it is is being put on a bypass machine while you're having open heart surgery, and it causes what they think are microbleeds in your brain which accentuates uh, any mental health issues you had before. Wow. So all my underlying PTSD, depression, anxiety, it like magnified it by tenfold. This is one of the reasons I had to start therapy. Um, oh. So I kind of, within six months, I was not doing well um, and luckily had some great coworkers and they did an intervention with me and got me into therapy. So that really helped. So, <laughs> so really, so I'm, I'm, it's interesting that you say that, Deborah, um, because it's not like you voluntarily went to therapy. And that, that's an interesting thing um, right. because you have good friends. They're the ones that helped to get you yeah. there. And that's why it's good to be able to tell people and explain to people the benefits of certain things. And I oh, think that's gosh, what yeah. we're doing more now as a community. I think we're bringing mm -hmm. that to others. We're telling people, Hey, it's okay not to be okay. It's okay it's, to go out there yes. and try to prevent suicide. It's okay. If you have mental health issues, it's fine. We yes. all, we all have something. It shouldn't take <laughs> us all to have a surgery to get there. Well, exactly. You know, and, and, when you think about all of these shootings and and things that were involved with these these traumas that were involved with on on the job, it's there's going to be that straw that breaks the camel's back. And if you get into therapy beforehand, those those triggers, those traumas are going to be lessened. Because you have the tools to help yourself through that trauma. I mean, it's not going to be the, <laughs> it's not good. You know, you're still going to have that trauma. But if you hadn't been in therapy, it could be a lot worse. If that makes sense. <laughs> you know, you're using those tools to, to, to help yourself through these other traumas. And hopefully come out smiling in the end. <laughs> No, Deborah, you're right. That's a, so. That's been one of my missions over the last almost three years now. Is I want to get to people before they have these traumatic incidents. Yes. I want police officers. I want recruits, cadets, whatever we want to call them. I want them in the academy to know you're going to face tough times, and yes. to get over these tough times, you have to develop who you are as a person. And that's kind of where my self awareness and law enforcement. That's where my push has been. So you're right. You're not going to stop the um. Getting your first nine one one call where you're see when you're hearing about a woman and her finding her daughter um committed suicide. You're not gonna you can't avoid that. You're not gonna avoid the kid getting stabbed. 
You're not going to avoid the bad car crash. You can't avoid that, but you have to be ready for it. Yes. I mean, and you can't be a fatalist either. You know, you can't you can't say, oh, my gosh, every single call is going to be, you know, this horrible, tragic incident. You know, you mean there's there's calls where, you know, it's a three year old playing on the phone and, you know, you you can laugh a little bit, you know, Um, (laughs) but you need to to also be realistic and say, hey, you know, there's a lot of not nice things that I'm going to be listening to. Um, we had a trainee once who I think she was there a month and she finally said, you know, I like looking at the world through rose colored glasses and Mm. I quit. Mm. (laughs) Hey, but she was real. She just didn't like to see that side of, oh, she, and you know, I would, I applauded her for it. You know, I mean, it, it. If you can't, it takes a certain type of person to do what we do. Um, maybe crazy, maybe <laughs> self abusive. I don't know, but you know, it takes a takes a, a a special person to do what we do and come out come out in the end. No, you're right, and I I <laughs> I was having this conversation with somebody a couple of weeks ago where we were talking about things we see in life, and I. Oh, I was telling that person too. I said, I was telling them, you know, I don't want you to see the things I, I've seen. I don't, I don't, I don't want that. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want you to go through the same trauma I've been through. That's what law enforcement first responders do. That's what we're, we're predisposed to oh, in a sense, like we, exactly. we expect it. So I don't want everybody to understand the bad side of life. Like you said, I don't want people to want to be fatalists. I, I don't want that either. Um, So I think it's important for people to understand that. And law enforcement, we're not looking for this, but we're going to encounter it. And when exactly. we encounter it, you have to understand why we view things the way we do. Mm-hmm. When one of, the, one of the traditional things that all law enforcement, I think you do the same thing, Deborah. We go to the <laughs> restaurant and we never want our back towards the door. I think that's all law enforcement. I, anybody that I have to person, fight my husband, though, for that seat. <laughs> but you're right. But think, but my husband's usually the one that's that's looking. And I feel, com- you know, if, if it's other people, yeah, I will have my back to the wall. But if it's my husband there, no, he's the one doing it for me. So I can re- relax a little bit. But, you know, norm- normal people, and I say normal, non-law enforcement, they don't <laughs> understand why. They're like, why do you have to sit all the way in the corner? I said, because in my experiences, which it's okay you haven't had these, and my experiences... I've had situations where if you don't see the threat coming, they're going to catch you off guard. Now, mm-hmm. none of us want this to happen. I, 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 I tell people, even the hardcore law enforcement officer, nobody wants to take another person's life. They no. say sometimes they'll say, "Oh, I want to get in the fight." They really don't. Especially the older you get, to realize your body doesn't recover as well. But exactly. none of us want to be caught off guard. None of us want to just go out and hurt people. Um, but we also understand that through some of the things that we've been through. We know it's a reality. Like it's like oh, we gosh, know it's yeah. possible. I mean, just through the dispatching side of it, you're the one that <laughs> receives these calls. Nine times out of ten, it's not like a police officer is just walking up on a robbery or a burglary. Exactly. Or, or <laughs> it's you, you, someone has told you, Deborah, in your role. Exactly. Hey, we just had a robbery at 123 Main Street. Can you send an officer? Or there's a shots, shots fired or active shooter. So right. it's not like it's something that you are are looking for, but it's something that you understand through life experience that things happen. And I tell people, if you haven't experienced it, I don't want you to learn this, but I do want you to have oh, a gosh. perspective that sometimes the way we react as law enforcement first responders, mm-hmm. it's going to be a little different because we've just had different experiences. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I, I take my grandson on walks. Um, every morning and uh, I am constantly watching the cars, you know, and I'm so concerned for his safety. I don't want anybody coming and grab him or, or even him just running out onto the street. But, um, you know, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm forever, you know, there's a car that's parked on the sidewalk that we have to r- walk next to who's in that car. Um, you know, where are my outs? Where's my weapon? 
that I can fight back with because I don't carry a gun. Um, but, you know, I it, these are things that because of the cumulative stress, because of the cumulative traumas, you become so hyper vigilant in your everyday life that it's just so difficult to, to get out of that. And, you know, being retired has, has helped a little, but, you know, I'm still, I still have those feelings and it's just, it's luckily, you know, I'm still in therapy so I could talk to my therapist about Good. it and yeah. You know, cause I, I probably will be in therapy for the rest of my life, you know? Um, my last, my last incident, um, is the one that caused me to retire. Um, so back in 2019 and we're coming up on four years, actually. Um, uh, one of my deputies was shot and killed, uh, at a call. And he was the first one that I ever was not able to send home. Mm. And, and that was the straw that broke my back so to say <laughs> so um but we came so far we had that critical incident stress debriefing afterwards we were i am um, my shift was was allowed to have three or four days off before going back to work um there was a lot of support for us which was really good but it's still just not enough um, and I lasted about a year at work before, uh, one of my supervisors locked me in her office with a pile of paperwork for work comp and said, fill that out, make your phone calls and we're going to get you some help, which wow. was really great. That's a good supervisor. She's awesome. <laughs> so I think she, uh, well, she was actually going to school to become a therapist. Okay. And- well. She saw the signs then whatever signs she saw, she was using yeah. her education. Yeah. Uh, the, my, my direct supervisor was not recognizing symptoms and using discipline rather than what needed to, to happen where I wasn't seeing my, what was going on. I was being angry and, uh, there was a lot of anger, <laughs> a lot of survivor's guilt, um, a lot of tears at work, uh, a lot of anxiety, and she just wasn't seeing it. And she wasn't a kind supervisor to begin with. And she j- she was a micromanager. And you just can't do that in law enforcement. And so, yeah, so I was getting disciplined and put on performance about eva- uh, improvement programs and all sorts of stuff. And, you know, my, the other supervisor said, Oh, nope, stop. And luckily admin, the administration was very supportive after, after she did that. But, you know, I could have, could have lost my job had it continued otherwise. Deborah, you know, I, I, I'm I'm happy you brought. I don't even know how we got to this point. I'm happy we <laughs> did, but recently I created a presentation called "Leading into Wellness," and what that program is designed for is helping leaders, leaders, yes, promote well wellness programs. Because what I realize is that a lot of agencies actually have peer support, cr- critical incident. Mm-hmm. They have um, employee assistance programs, EAP. They have all of this, but it's the leaders that are struggling to promote and recognize. And that's been one of the key things that I talk about in my program is recognizing when your staff is suffering, recognizing when they're different because they're going to be the ones. Ultimately, I hate to say it. Leaders are the ones that's going to promote you going into these programs. Like you said, the second leader, that person is the one that recognized you had problems. The first one. She didn't realize that she was driving you to a deeper hole. And that's some of the problems that I see. Right. And it's not, I don't think it was that first leader's, um, I don't think it was her object. Like, I don't think that was her mission to drive you, but that was her. It was, but (laughs) 
<laughs> that's but, a whole other story. <laughs> well, no, but some people don't know. But like I, I, I tell people, you lead sometimes the way you know how to. Like I used to say things back as a younger leader that I thought was right because another leader told me. And then I started exactly. studying leadership. Yeah. I started studying leadership and I started getting stronger mentors. And they're like, Michael, you may not want to say this. You may want right. to promote that. And what I realized is that I just didn't know better. So one of the things that I've been talking about even more lately, because I realized there's a lot of people out here. There's a lot of great people that have stories like yours, Deborah. people I've had on the show, people coming up on the show that are really promoting mental wellness. Yes. But I'm going to take it a little step further because one of my passions and one of my one of my missions is developing leaders. So I'm like, well, I need to develop leaders in these mental wellness programs because I need them to learn how to drive people that need it. And one of the mm-hmm. first things that you said, and that's um, like I said, I was so happy when I heard you say this word because <laughs> that's part of my three part system. The very first thing is recognize, recognize yes. the signs, and it may not, and it won't be verbal. It will not no. be verbal signs because no. Deborah, I'm probably sure you probably just. <laughs> sucked it up and you probably said, yeah, I'm fine. But if that leader was paying attention to the way you said it and your body language each and every day, she would have realized that, no, you're not okay. You need the help. Right. Well, you know, and me turning around and yelling at her too, just, that would do it. (laughs) Yeah. That would do it too. But then, but that person, there was a whole other different dynamic going on also uh, between her and I, which, um, she was bound and determined to get me fired. So, um, luckily I had this other supervisor that, that came to my rescue. Um, cause I wanted to stay in for 30 years. You know, there, there's a lot of us that have that, that, that want and need to stay in to get that magical number for retirement and not realizing how much we're hurting ourselves doing it. And, you know, I mean, I took a big hit on my retirement, retiring when I did, but I'm a happier person now because of it. Ooh, and <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You know, it took me a little bit to realize that, but um, I'm not under the stress anymore. I'm not, mm. I, 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 I have a, a weekend job that's six hours a day. And the, my boss actually asked me to do a 12 hour shift uh, a couple weeks ago. And I said, yeah, sure. No problem. I've done that before. I was dragging by the end of that and going, how the heck was I doing this before? You know, cause you know, we all have shift work and 12 hour, 10 hour, 12 hour shifts, you know, and I not realizing how much of a toll that is taking on out on our bodies and our mental health and working nights and then having to switch to days, you know, and um, being a mom, it's kind of, uh, I don't know if it's with dads, but with moms, you're, you're mom, you've got to be there. You're the one to clean the house, to do the laundry to do the dishes, to, to be there and, and, you know, wipe their, wipe their boo-boos and, <laughs> uh, you know, kiss them on the forehead and send them to school. But then you have to work graveyards and how do you do that? And it's just, it's a big juggle. And I didn't realize how much of a toll it took out of me until I retired. And, not oh my gosh not enjoying my time off if that makes any sense you know okay yeah i have a day off but that day off is now cleaning the house and doing the laundry and and all these other things and not relaxing and it just you know oh maybe i should have had my taught my kids a little better and had them do the chores for me but <laughs> You were tired, though. You were on graveyard shift. How are you going to do it? Exactly. You know, and what was funny is um, um, I used to get up at 4.30 in the afternoon and you'd hear my alarm go off. And then all of a sudden you'd start hearing doors shutting around the house. It was the kids going to hide. (laughs) (laughs) 
not having to deal with me for the first half hour that I was awake. <laughs> so yeah, you know, the, there was a lot of things that that it, yeah, I just it took a lot out, and I'm finally realizing it. Fifty six years old, how much it took out on me. But uh, now I'm I'm using my time wisely and spending a lot of time with grandkids and even my kids. And, you know, it's never too late to get those relationships back for sure. And just enjoying my retirement now. And, you know, it's cool. Um, You're not completely like retired, so to speak, when it comes to law enforcement. And when I say that, I'm going to say because one thing we talked about in the green room before we started was you've done 13 podcasts. Um, yes. Because <laughs> you're out there looking and hunting because that's the cool part about it is that although you're retired, you still love the industry so much you didn't completely cut it off. Because I know other folks oh, that's gosh, retired, yeah. Yeah. They, they won't they, they won't even um turn the news on. They won't even. Oh, I do don't anything. do that either. <laughs> 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 oh no no what? no! I haven't. Oh my gosh! I haven't watched the news since uh, uh, two thousand eight. So, um, took that stress right out. <laughs> Good choice. Oh so, my gosh! What what is so you one like I said one thing that you've really been pushing persistent consistent on is being on podcasts and spreading your message and allowing people to hear your story. What is your goal with that? Like what what if you had to take away one thing? from these podcasts that you've been doing, what is driving you to push this information out? To get people to realize that everybody has mental health issues. You don't get out of this profession without it. Sooner that we can teach the recruits and trainees that they need to get in there and they need to start mental health therapy or whatever it is to them early in their career so that it what happened to me doesn't happen to them. If that makes any sense at all. <laughs> no. You know, yeah, that makes perfect we've sense. Gotta have, we've got to have those tools to help our our, our frontline staff to deal with the horrors that we are seeing out on the streets and to deal with life and to deal with, uh, to deal with these traumas before they're actual, uh, before the PT becomes a PTSI and uh, an injury rather than a disorder. Um, we don't, we don't want to see everybody because if it continues on the way it is, everybody's going to have PTSD getting out of this job. And that what we need to do is start early and make sure that that doesn't happen. Hmm. I've, I've never heard that angle or version of it in a sense of everybody having it in the industry. And honestly, I think everybody will. And this is just me. I can't say I've done a research or a study. <laughs> But it's the way we manage it and how we right. learn to positively deal with some of the stress we have. Because right. I, I, Deborah, you probably sit in the same boat as I do um, in a sense of I didn't always handle things as constructively as I do now. I didn't always <laughs> talk to the people in the right way. I mean, I can tell you I had several alcohol heavy nights or doing other things like playing video games all night, which isn't negative, oh. but it ain't positive either. Um, no, <laughs> but, but, but you know what I mean? Like, or wasting time versus getting out there and finding right. somebody early on. And I know when people hear, Hey, you're doing therapy right out the Academy. Well, depends on what happened that not everybody comes to the Academy with a wealth of life experience, meaning that right. not everybody has seen people get shot when they were growing up. Not everybody's lived through hard times. And sometimes it's a shell shock for some people to all of a sudden, your first call, you're like, oh, crap, this woman just found her kid um, deceased. Like that might be that could be anybody's first call. And if you're not ready for it, your brain will not know how to react. I, I don't care how tough exactly. you, think you are. I don't care what you think, you know, 
your brain is going to be like, Mm-mm, not today. Exactly. And we need to be teaching this in our academies for everybody, fire, police, dispatch. Mm-hmm. It needs to be taught in the academies and not just a, a one hour block or whatever. There needs to be a big chunk of time that is related to mental health, whether it's giving critical incident stress management classes at the academy, along with having therapists come in or um, clinicians and talking to them and having people like me use, you know, have the academies use their, their retirees to come in and tell their stories and answer questions of, you know, about mental health and getting them prepared and, giving them the right tools so that when they do go out for that first for that first nasty call they're prepared because that nasty call is coming whether they want whether, whether they whether, want to or not exactly you know sooner you know sooner or later they're going to get one and if we can prepare our cops our firefighters our dispatchers even you know nurses even our uh, our soldiers so that they're prepared for this and and are able to deal with it and give them the mental health tools that they can utilize it it's better for all of us it's you know i can't stress it enough it's big picture thinking i mean it's <laughs> something that you know and, and in the state of california I I want to say I've got I've done some research, not a lot, but I believe now post, which is the state accreditation process for that right. state. And every every I, I just let you know, I, mean, I know you probably know this, Deborah. Every state calls it something <laughs> a little different. Like in right. Texas, we call it T. Cole. Um, in Georgia, they call it post. Florida, they call it, I think, FDL. I can't remember FDLE or something yeah. like that. But I know specifically from what I was told, and I don't know if it started yet that in the state of California. Everybody that goes to the academy effects of whatever date, they're going to take a mental wellness class. So I'm seeing the push towards that, which is good. Mm -hmm. And I know California has been known to be um, different at times, but I think oh, this, yeah. is good, different. <laughs> this is a good different. I like, I mean, di I like good different. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, but it's, you know, sometimes it takes sometimes that radical thinking, so to speak, to help elevate the industry. And like I said, exactly. I forgot someone told me I had not seen it in writing myself, but when they told me about that post, I was like, that's a great idea. I, they, I think they even made it a law. Like it was something with there's the something that's going on. Yeah. And I think that, um, cause I did a, um, I did a citizens Academy actually with my oh, local police good. department this year, which was actually kind of fun. Um, but we got a tour of the, uh, Sheriff's Academy here in town in Sacramento. And uh, that I think that was mentioned that they they were doing some mental health. Maybe not enough, but, you know, it, it's a start. Deborah, if we do 15 minutes of it nowadays, I, I'm happy from what it was back in the day. And and my oh back my in the day is a little different from yours. You have, <laughs> you, yeah, you have more experience than I do, so I'm not going to take that away. But I know when I started in 2005, these conversations were around, but not like they are today. So no. any progression, anything that we do, even if Post says, hey, we're going to make them do an, one eight-hour block, I'm happy because that's better than a zero-hour block that they had before. Absolutely. So anything yeah. is a start. Obviously, mm -hmm. we would love to have a 40 hour block, but at some point, we got to be realistic. And I, I know, Deborah, I've been through several academies at this point. How much longer do we are we going to extend it at some point? Like, you know, what I mean, that's what that's what some of it boils down to is what do you add? What do you take away? How do you modify it? And I think that's where some of the scholars and academy directors, that's what they're facing is trying to figure out how to squeeze it in. But regardless of how they do it, they need to do it. It, exactly you know uh it basic training in in the military is depending on which branch of service is he six six weeks to 12 15 weeks long mm -hmm. 
And then they expect you to be an adult and go out and shoot people. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. I mean, sorry. The, the, sorry. Hey, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but I mean, honestly, no, but hey, Deborah, that's, I mean, honestly, um, I had who not have on, had on my show and I haven't released the, this episode yet, but he was telling me um, a guy named Banning Sweat. Now, you know what? I had him on the first hour. He talked about him going into the military, going into the Marines early on. But at 18, once he, which like, once you've done your boot camp, you're out there and depends on when you get, when you go through boot camp, you're actually, you may be deployed in a place like Afghanistan and you're right at 18. It's like, okay, you went to boot camp, You better be ready to take a life. Exactly. You know? And so how can we expect, why aren't we training them a little, you know, a week longer? It's mm -hmm. just a week. Add it to curriculums and get that mental health training out there, whether it's sending it. I, I know California has uh, critical incident stress management classes that are three days long. Send your recruits to that or bring that in to be taught at your academies. It's so important to learn the basics and learn how to utilize your peer support, learn how to utilize your mental health system and find those resources in case you actually need them. And if you don't need them, have those resources to give to your buddy because you're the one that need, is going to see that your buddy's not doing well and say, hey, you know, here, call these people. That's what we need to lift ourselves up, lift each other up and get better at this. And I think we're, we are getting better because never when I, when I first created this presentation, my book called greatness beyond the badge that, um, that I, that I, that I talk about a lot. Um, when I first came out with it about two years ago, when I was being booked at conferences, that wasn't what people really wanted to hear. They wanted to hear my leadership, my motivation. And then <laughs> as 2023 started to come around, that's pretty much the main presentation people want. And, you know, for a speaker like me, I realize trends and that's the trend I'm happy to see because leadership, we're always going to talk about that. That's always going to be a given. Yeah. But the mental wellness, self-awareness, mental health is something that is being put on the forefront. So I can appreciate all the leaders that I've been dealing with lately that I have seen incorporating this into their vision because they want it. They understand it. And now they just need help from people like us to push it. So it's there, Deborah. I can tell you, it's. it's so I was actually <laughs> asked about six months ago. Um, the assistant chief of police, Ruben Ramirez. We were talking on the phone, and he was like, "Hey, Michael, you know, I got this program, and do you really think this is going to be really relevant to law enforcement as I come and transition to retirement?" And I was like, "Ruben, you're going to be surprised. You're going to be having people knock down the door <laughs> because people care about that now, which is good." So, yes, Deborah, I do see the shift. It's not obviously it's not as fast as people like you, you and me want it, but it's there and it's better than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, better than it was five oh. years ago. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It, it just seeing the difference between um, 2007 and um, the shooting then and my shooting in 2019, just seeing the the changes, the leaps and bounds different and if we can continue that progression then you know hopefully in 10 years we won't have to have these discussions anymore it'll already be there which i hope i hope <laughs> i hope yeah that's i mean that's all you can do we can have we got to be optimistic about what's there because if not i mean you still you still got to try that Exactly. Like I said, there's actually a an author, uh, a, a, a professor. He's actually based out of California, I believe, and he actually wrote about emotional survival and law enforcement. Um, Doctor. Oh, Doctor Gil Martin. Yeah. Yes. But, well, but it's crazy. I actually because, got to meet him, and yeah. he is fabulous. <laughs> but, you, but you know what's funny, Deborah? He was two decades ahead of his time. Like I tell oh my people gosh, all yeah. the time, I was like, they're like, oh yeah. I said, y'all know he wrote that that book in 2001, right? And did he really? <laughs> I didn't even look. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, so that's the cool part. Why, why I say that to say that we've been having these conversations for a while now. However, there's more people that are believing in them. And that's where I see the push going. Oh gosh. Yeah. 
Dr. Gilmartin is one of the books that I have kept. And, you know, I still reference it and I still push his book and tell everybody to buy it because it is a good read and it has a lot of good things in it. Um, and have your family read it too, you know, mm-hmm. and let your, so that your family knows what, what's going on and how to read the, how to read the signs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. I, and I reached out to, I, I meant the man supposed to be talking. I forgot to call him back or I forgot to email him back. So I got to get him on here and, Tell them that um, Deborah's pushing your book like a marketer out there. Oh my gosh, I am. You know, I've got it right here. So I'd like a couple of podcasts I've been on. I hold it up and go buy this book. <laughs> oh, I'll see if I had it behind me. I have it upstairs. I so it, I can't even I say I have it. it. Oh, it's yeah. up there. Oh, I thought that was it. No, no, I um, thought, no, I look, I was like, because it, it is upstairs though. So I can't say I do have it, but, but yeah. you know, Deborah, as we're, we're, we're rounding out the episode and I know you and I could talk all night and most people oh, that get gosh. on the show, I tell them once we get going, you're going to be like, Michael, why are you stopping? But for the sake of everybody's <laughs> time, I always am appreciative of that. And um, I do want to know if people are looking for you, if they want to hear your story, if they just want to know more about you, where can they find you? Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I am also on Facebook. Um, I have I have a YouTube presence, but I don't publish anything. I'm also on TikTok and have put out a few things. Um, and I'm on Twitter, but I keep that special. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. my fun place. <laughs> uh, or X. That's... I think they call it X now. I X think it's X now. Or... Yes, X. I'm sorry. X. Yeah. Sorry. I, I didn't even it, know it was still... X. I, I was looking for the Twitter app about, what was it, two months ago maybe? And I was like, where's my Twitter? I, I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> I have like 25 <laughs> followers. And I was yeah. like, what is this X thing on my phone? And then I was like, oh, that's Twitter. So oh, that's Twitter. Yeah, I do. I do a few other a few. I, I'm i I'm an activist against uh, uh, abusive cults. So I uh, that's where my Twitter is usually at. You know, I a lot okay. of religious cults out there that that are very abusive that I do some activism. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> along right. with everything else that I do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hey, everybody has their things. So, okay. So LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, X, um, people can X. find you. Um, so what final words do you have for the audience? Oh, actually not for the audience, for the top cops. Okay. I'm going to reach Ooh. out and, and tell these guys, the sheriffs, the chiefs that we have a problem and they're they're the ones that need to push to get it fixed. And they need to have this passion that we have also so that we n- we're not losing people. Mm. When it comes down to it, when you have the attrition and the suicide rate that we have in first responders it directly how do i put this <laughs> people don't look at the line staff people don't look at the sergeants they look at the leaders they look at the administration they look at the chiefs and the de- and the s- sheriffs and say what are you doing and they need to take a good look in that mirror and ask themselves, what are we doing? We need to do better. Mm. That's I think that's that's perfect right there. And you know what, Deborah? You're right. And that's I and when I say a lot of the places I speak now are sheriffs and chiefs association. That's been my main client over the last 18 months to two years. And I can tell you, some are definitely pushing that now because. It's amazing because they they see it. They just don't know because you got to think a lot of these chiefs and sheriffs, Deborah, you got to think about the generation. I mean, that they, they grew up through yeah, the ranks. They're... I mean, think about I mean, Deborah, think about it. We're telling, oh, yeah, we're telling what what people call old dogs to learn a new trick. <laughs> like, exactly. like seriously, we're, we're and so you're right. They are the 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 leaders. They do lead by example. But I can tell you from my own experience that they are starting to do it a lot better. It's just going to take them a little bit longer because it's about shifting a mindset that hasn't been there. 
and they haven't had to, but exactly. I do see, I do see the progression. I promise you from my own perspective, I see people moving, but they still need to understand that. Yes. As the top cop, as a chief, the sheriff, the director, the superintendent, whatever title we have, yes, <laughs> at the lead, <laughs> you're at the head of the spear and people are going to follow you into the fire. Even if they don't know you, they're going to exactly. follow you to the end of the day because they trust you and they trust that at minimum, at minimum, they're going to trust the position. They may not trust the person all the time, but <laughs> they're going to trust if someone selects you as a chief. If you say, you know what? Mental wellness is important. That's going to at least get people started on the path that it is. But exactly. if you say, hey, you know what? No, nah, we don't have no mental wellness issues. No, everybody knows who they are. We don't have issues. <sighs> <laughs> people are going to say okay so you're right so deborah those are great final words um you definitely i think rounded out um this great episode that we have and i do appreciate your time i know once again i know your passion is there because the way you reached out to me consistently <laughs> it let me know that you're not you're no joke and that's what that's what it has to be because we have to be pushing for our fellow brothers and sisters no matter what color you wear each and every exactly. day. And we have to be persistent because sometimes they don't know. They exactly. don't understand because they haven't been through it or they don't think anybody's there that there's people out here like us for yep. them. So yep. Deborah, once again, I appreciate you taking your time to be on the show tonight. <laughs> I appreciate all the viewers, the listeners, the people that reach out to me commenting on my my um, podcast and telling me hey they love to hear all the stories and the experiences so i appreciate all of you guys i definitely feel the love and that's what drives me each and every day because <laughs> as i said before episodes ago i actually stopped the podcast for a while because once i didn't have time and i wasn't too sure of the impact but now i see it and i feel it and that's what it's all about so once again guys thank you for viewing thank you for being who you are and definitely stay safe and keep holding the line down. You've been listening to the LEO First Podcast. Michael has been in law enforcement since 2005. He's worked for three law enforcement agencies in three different states. He's a professional speaker who travels the country teaching about leadership development and self-awareness. And he's the author of a book called Greatness Beyond the Badge, The Three Key Principles for Self-Awareness. It's Michael's passion to bring law enforcement members' stories to the front so you get the real and raw take. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hook up with Michael on YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Michael Laidler. On Twitter at Michael A. Laidler. On Facebook at Michael Laidler Leadership. Send an email to Michael at MichaelALaidler.com. And hit the website at MichaelALaidler.com. See you next time on the LEO First Podcast.